This is my amp. It doesn't work right now. No. I'm not like Bob Bruno where it's like, Billy Zoom made this. It's so cool. <laughs> So we are in my living room. This is where I do um, a lot of my rehearsing. And this is where I keep all of my guitars. And it's where I keep most of my like rare and special pedals. So let me show you some of my guitars. This is my Ed O'Brien signature Stratocaster. I got this because it has the sustainer pickup in it. It also has my Gizmotron, which is this device right here. This is a mechanical Boeing device. A lot of people ask me why I put uh, basically like a mechanical sustainer on a guitar that has built-in sustainer. And the answer to that is I was touring Studio 606 and I saw that they had an Ed O'Brien signature Strat on the wall with a Gizmotron. And I thought if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So that's why I got the idea to put it on there. Uh, and I do use both things. I use the Gizmotron and I use the sustainer pickup. Uh, not at the same time, because uh, that would be kind of silly, but uh, I find that there's a use for every different type of um, sustaining mechanism and I love them all. This Jazzmaster is a, a Troy Van Leeuwen signature model in oxblood. This one's all stock as, uh, as per Troy's specs. This Jazzmaster, I actually have tuned to fifths um, and I used it um, to compose a piece that I was commissioned to write for a cellist. So uh, having it tuned to fifths was like super uh, helpful for, for doing that. Um, but I originally got the idea for uh, the tuning um, from like a, a Robert Fripp tuning. So uh, this comes out when I need like a little extra alternate tuning inspiration. This is my main Fender Jazzmaster. This is the American Professional Series Jazzmaster. Shelby Pollard over at Chicago Music Exchange sent me these custom shop Chicago special pickup. So I have those in there and I have the, the mastery bridge. And um, this is my main jazz master. You'll see me playing this a lot. Louisiana, it was not the easiest finding out about um, 
about underground music. When I found out about Sonic Youth, that was really kind of like the gateway getting into the type of music that would, uh, in my college years, really like inform the type of music that I make. Sonic Youth led me to Glenn Branca, led me to Reese Chatham, led me to these like immense guitar armies that inspired me to pursue a, a solo electric guitar project. I found out about music by reading books or by uh, opening records in the record store and just throwing them on. And it was this very kind of like solitary journey. Uh, I found that I kind of like drifted apart from I mean, like my friends from school because I was like getting into this whole world of music. And um, I saved up and bought my first guitar when I was 17, which is like fairly late for a lot of people. But it kind of took me on this this path that diverged a bit from like the way things had been leading up to that point. So it was a really beautiful experience. But I think just because of where I grew up and the fact that this was like outside of the mainstream and outside of the norm, it led me to kind of, yeah, like a more isolated path. have some of my uh, vintage pedals uh, on display on the wall here. I really kind of love how uh, it's, it's functional art. They're beautiful and I can also just uh, grab them really easily and uh, put them on my board and make sounds with them. I started collecting these like vintage Maxon pedals. Uh, rotary phaser. It was very difficult for me to track down. It's pretty excited to score that. The Univox Super Fuzz I got um, for touring with Iggy and uh, it's amazing. Not the most practical pedal to bring on the road, but uh, I love it. It sounds great. I like keeping it on my wall. I have the Ibanez AD80, uh, which graces the cover of the Stompbox book, uh, Lee Ronaldo's pedal is the one on the cover. He was inspiration behind me originally getting that pedal. These pedals are made by Retroactive Pedals. It's a guy named Trey Bourgeois uh, from my home state of Louisiana. Um, he's from New Orleans originally, and uh, so I was really drawn to that. The pedals are great. I actually found out about him through my friend Bob Bruno. He recommended I check out the Dot Chaser pedal and they're amazing. Up top, I have Lip State Artist Series uh, Keely Loomer. I honestly can't take any credit for that pedal being amazing. The design was based on uh, My Bloody Valentine sound. So it has like a fuzz circuit on the right and on the left is uh, three really cool different reverb options, including like a reverse reverb. So Keely approached me about doing original artwork for that. So all I contributed to that is the design, uh, but it has my name on it. So I feel like it's uh, one of my children. On the other side, the Rever pedal is uh, actually collaboration between my friends Data Choir and Old Blood Noise Endeavors. So I think those ladies are amazing. And uh, I like having it up there on my, my wall of special things. So these are my love tone pedals. These I'm very proud and excited to have. The Ring Stinger and the Flange with No Name are two pedals I, I acquired, a really amazing local shop called Uniform Music. I noticed that Eric, the owner, he had the Doppelganger, the Wobulator, and the Meatball. So I ended up going back and trading a Klon for those three pedals. I'm very, very excited to have those pedals feel like piece of pedal history. They sound great too. So I ended up in Austin, Texas for college. You know, I was studying film, um, but I was playing music anytime I wasn't in school. My 
uh, last semester of college, I saw that Glenn Branca was doing live performances of his symphony number no. 13, and uh, he was looking to recruit like 100 guitars for each performance. And I applied to perform at the Montclair, New Jersey performance, and it was crazy. I had to email all my professors and explain why I'd be missing like the first week of, of classes. And I said, you know, it was my dream to perform with Glenn Branca, who's my favorite composer. I flew up to New Jersey and I was a part of this performance. I met a lot of people that I remained in contact with. Ty Braxton was at that performance. Not long after that, my um, college duo I was performing in, we got invited to perform at the Table of the Elements Festival in Atlanta. And in addition to performing with my band, One Umbrella, I was asked if I would perform with Reese Chatham. That was like one of the top five best days of my life when I got that when I got that email asking if I could perform with Reese Chatham. So in like the same year I got to perform with like two of my biggest um, heroes in that realm. Two of the um, composers who really inspired me to think of the guitar as a an instrument that could exist on its own, that could create a symphony of sounds. It was amazing. And I kind of took all of these experiences and decided to, um, to move to New York City as soon as I graduated. So uh, I graduated from UT December 2007, uh, and I was in Brooklyn January 3rd, 2008. So these are my pedals by Dr. No Effects. He's a very enigmatic pedal builder based in the Netherlands. The one in the center here is actually my signature pedal that he created uh, inspired by my music. It's called the Moon Canyon, which is where I was living when I, I first moved to Los Angeles. So it's kind of inspired by that environment, that landscape. It has a uh, overdrive circuit and effects loop a reverb and delay and there's a moon in the center and uh, the um, it lights up kind of like different phases of the moon based on which circuit is engaged. I feel very uh, very honored that it uh, has my name on it. Um, these are some of his other pedals. Uh, the two uh, flanking either side here uh, he created in collaboration with Troy Van Leeuwen. This one's an Octavia Fuzz. And this one is a, uh, a volume boost and a filter. The mother brain is an analog delay. Uh, that's the first Dr. No pedal uh, I ever had. He sent that to me. Kafuz up top and the Necro Fuzzicon. Um, beautiful pieces of art that you can also put on your pedal board and stomp on. I have some of my other guitars over here. This is my built Relevator. Built Guitars got in touch with me about um, me playing one of their guitars. And of course, I took that opportunity to ask them to create <laughs> the most like complicated um, and amazing guitar that they make for me. Um, so this Relevator has um, effects built into it. And um, mine, in particular, has a, a fuzz circuit down here with a... Um, oscillator built in. And then up here, it has two different um, boards, the same uh, pedal, and that's the Old Blood Noise Endeavors um, Dark Star Pad Reverb. So this side has the, uh, the reverb with the delay circuit. So all of these di di dials control those parameters. And on this side, this has the reverb with the, uh, the pitch circuit. So these dials control the, uh, the pitch and this uh, controls the mix of the, uh, of the effect. A lot of people ask me, I have so many pedals and I <laughs> use a massive pedal board. Why would I wanna have effects built into my guitar? But I find that just having access with your hands and having 
the ability to control the dials and everything up here while you're playing. It, it's really inspiring. And also being forced to have like reverb right in the beginning of your chain just allows you to make interesting choices and it's great uh, as a rock guitar as well as a soundscaping guitar. So I was playing with my band One Umbrella for a while doing instrumental music and this opportunity came up to be a part of this compilation called Women Take Back the Noise. I was like, hey, I have this great project One Umbrella. Um, can we submit a track? And she was like, is it all female? I was like, no. <laughs> She's like, sorry, it's only for women. So I was like, well, I guess I can record something that's just me. I came up with the name Noveller to release that track. It was really amazing to be able to do that. That was something that was just me. And um, it really kind of empowered me to, to start making solo music. And once I moved to, to New York, I started getting asked to play live Noveller shows. The more that I performed, the more I got asked to play. And so the project really evolved through playing live. That's really how I transitioned from playing the double neck guitar, laying flat on the keyboard stand, to actually like having a deeper relationship with the guitar as an instrument. So it's really in those early years of me playing live in Brooklyn that Noveller became kind of like a uh, melodic exploration of the guitar. And um, I became kind of more confident in playing the guitar. I was never trained, I never took lessons on how to play the instrument. And so it, it always kind of like informed that I had to really go outside of the box to make music with the guitar because I didn't like know what I was doing. And that really changed and evolved in those early years. So this is my uh, not Gibson, Gibson double neck guitar. Don't let the oversized headstocks fool you. Uh, this is like a Chinese ripoff. When I first started uh, making music under the name Noveller, I used a double neck guitar. And um, they're really heavy, so I'd always lay it flat on a keyboard stand. Like use e bows or use um, cello bows or like drop chains on it or just do whatever I could think of to it. You know, this was like the, the first guitar that I used when I started performing solo. And um, unfortunately, I no longer have my original double neck. Uh, that was purchased via layaway at a pawn shop in Austin, Texas when I was in college. I ended up selling that a while back when I was in Brooklyn because I really needed the money. And um, I told myself, like, at some point, I'll, uh, I'll be able to get one again. And it just so happens that an <laughs> uh, amazing uh, music store here in um, Los Angeles called Future Music had this in the store. The price was really amazing. And I think I like traded a few pedals and uh, was able to get it for like 300 bucks. So this is my current double neck guitar. Um, I love it. Sometimes I'll get nostalgic and throw it on a keyboard stand and put triple Ebos on it and have some fun with it.
growing up in Louisiana, uh, most of the shows, if bands toured through the state at all, were in New Orleans, and it was really hard for me as like a young teenager because the shows were always at bars and they were almost always 21 plus. But sometimes there would be a show that was 18 and older. And I happened to turn 18 right before Sonic Youth was touring through New Orleans and playing at Tipitina's. So I was able to go see Sonic Youth at Tipitina's on their Murray Street tour. And it was incredible. Just like watching the show was amazing. But then I got to go backstage and I got to meet Thurston and meet Lee and meet Kim and meet Jim O'Rourke, who I was obsessed with. I actually have pictures of me with Thurston and with Lee. And when I think back on it, I just, I like think about if the girl in the photo knew that in just like a few years, she would be playing music with those people. And uh, funnily enough, I'm actually wearing a, uh, a Stooges pin on like the shirt at the show. So I'm like wearing like an Iggy Pop pin standing next to like Lee Ronaldo and Thurston Moore and um, just come a long way since that moment. It kind of blows my mind to like look back on that. So this is the studio part of my home. Uh, this is where I keep most of my pedals. And um, this is a relic from my past. This is my very first guitar amplifier. It's a Dan Electro Dirty 30. Uh, it's the piece of gear that I have owned the longest. I love it. Um, I don't use it that often, but um, it feels like a piece of my history. This is my very first guitar pedal. Ibanez TS7. I got this from Lafayette Music in my hometown, and uh, it's served me well. Hot switch on here which I found to be really great when I was first starting to use a uh, cello bow on my guitar. That really like helped me get a, a good sound with that. This is a Kai head rush I got at a pawn shop in Louisiana. When I was um, doing my early novella sets, I was using for looping two Line 6 DL4s and, and a Kai head rush. It has a lot of sentimental value. I think it's a great pedal. Over here, have um, a lot of my, my favorite pedal brands represented. My very first Earthquaker pedal was the White Light Overdrive. So in uh, 2012, I was playing a show uh, for WFMU in um, the Chelsea neighborhood in, uh, in New York City and made the mistake of leaving my gear in the car while I went to dinner. My pedal board got stolen. So uh, I was kind of forced at that point to reassess, rebuild my collection. I went to Main Drag Music in Brooklyn, and I was like, look, I have to rebuild everything from scratch. And I remember one of the employees recommending uh, Earthquaker devices to me, and I ended up buying this overdrive. So that was the beginning for me of uh, a beautiful relationship with Earthquaker devices. Um, as you can see from one pedal, my collection has grown too many. I have the complete collection of Maris pedals. They are based in uh, Ventura, California, and they're amazing people. They make great pedals. I'm really honored to have a relationship with them. Uh, I have my Red Panda pedals, uh, really, Really inspiring, um, more on the experimental side. I've had the, the great joy of going to their headquarters uh, when I'm in Detroit. Great people, amazing pedals. Um, Mr. George Tripps, way huge, represented up there. Uh, lives right here in Los Angeles. Love hanging out with him. Love the Atreides analog weirding module his latest and greatest. I'm obsessed with the Electro Harmonics 9 series. You will almost always find one of these pedals on my board. The first one I got was the Mel 9, which is like their, their Mellotron pedal. It actually came out in 2016 when I was touring uh, as the opening act for Iggy Pop. And I remember pre-ordering it. And when I was home, like a break between 
the, the legs of the tour, it was waiting for me and I immediately put it on my board. What I always say I love about the, the 9 Series pedals is like, they really nailed the tracking. Uh, that can really make or break um, a pedal, like a, an emulator pedal or a synth pedal. And uh, they've really got that dialed in to perfection. So I have the Mel 9, the Synth 9, Key 9, and the Bass 9. On the top here, uh, I really love these spiral electric effects pedals. I have the Black Spiral Fuzz, uh, which is based off of the um, Maestro Fuzz circuit. And then I have, I believe it's called the Yellow Rose Overdrive. Tom Cram, formerly of uh, Digitech, designed those. It's his company, is branching out on his own. The Boomerang three phrase sampler. This is my ride or die looper. I mentioned earlier that for looping, I used to use two DL4s and the Akai Headrush. This piece of equipment is basically responsible for um, me making music as novella and performing live. What I love about it is it has the three dedicated looping banks. Um, you can loop freely. They have a free mode where you could have one loop that's two minutes, one loop that's two seconds, and one loop that's somewhere in between, and they'll just loop completely untethered autonomously uh, until the end of time. It's amazing. But you can also do uh, synced looping. So if you're doing something that's um, more structured, uh, you can lay down a master loop. Let's say it's 10 seconds. The subsequent loops just have to be some like exponent of that. So. I find that that's a really unique feature. It's one thing that always has me coming back to the boomerang. So you could have a really short loop and then you could just have a loop that's like a multiple of that. I find that it helps me as a looping artist create music that still feels like it has flow and development, even though you're hearing recorded music looping back on itself. Moog, Mother32, and DFAM. I used these when I was uh, writing the music for my record, Arrow. I've never uh, tried to use them in the live setting, but I find that they're really great studio tools. I don't claim to be an expert in using them, but I find them really inspiring. Really happy to have, have it in my collection. I get a lot of questions about this instrument. This is the Folk Tech Nano Garden. It's an electroacoustic instrument. So you plug it in here. It has uh, some preset banks here. It's a filter, um, mix level, different parameters. I started using this to kind of create a percussive element in my music. Being a guitar and effects based uh, soundscape artist, I was looking for something to add a little bit rhythmic elements that was outside of the guitar. And this is what I found. I find that it's like it's really unique and um, you get some really nice organic sounds. It's really reliable to use in a live setting. So this is the Asm Bells experimental percussion. Um, 
These are made in Italy. I found it through Reverb.com. I saw a picture of it and I was immediately intrigued. And uh, I think I watched a video of the creator bowing the daxophone, bowing the cymbal, and I immediately purchased it. And uh, now it lives with me. Um, I've used this thing um, uh, in my scoring work. I use bowed daxophone for some of the cues I created for the uh, Roadrunner film about Anthony Bourdain. Bowed cymbal is always like something I wanted to uh, be able to add to my sound textures and now I can do that. Uh, these chimes here actually use a rubber mallet and if you rub it on the side of the chime you can get these beautiful like whale song sounds. And then we have these, these fun guys here. They don't get used all that much, but I love that they're there. So one of like the top five uh, moments of my life was when um, I got like a random message, someone I didn't know on Facebook saying, uh, Iggy Pop just played your music on his BBC radio show and said like the nicest things about you. <laughs> like that was one of the top five moments of my life. And that was in the summer of 2015. I had no idea that just like uh, four months later, I'd be getting an email from Iggy's manager saying, hey, would Noveller want to be the opening act on Iggy's upcoming tour? <laughs> Iggy really like changed my life, him becoming a fan of my music through the like, YouTube's algorithm is how he discovered my music. Like he was watching something else and then like it just showed Noveller after that, like me performing some random live show and he was like, this is cool. So yeah, I became the opening act on his uh, post-pop depression tour. We did dates in uh, North America and in Europe. Probably the greatest thing was just watching him perform night after night. His band was incredible, was the, all the Queens of the Stone Age guys and Matt Helders on drums, Matt Sweeney on bass. It was a total dream and uh, that was all in 2016. After that is when I decided to leave New York and move to Los Angeles. And I've been in LA for not even a year when I got an email from Iggy's manager saying, here's a recording of Iggy uh, reading Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle, basically intimating that like Iggy didn't necessarily know he was doing this, but like, hey, check out this recording and maybe like do what you do create like a soundscape for it. I remember it was like right around my birthday. I didn't really have any plans and I just like spent my birthday writing this music, this like soundscape and I sent it to Henry. I was like, okay, well, you know, that was fun. That was, that was something, a creative exercise. Then like a few months later, it was like, hey, Iggy thought that was really cool. Can you do another one? And uh, so I wrote like another piece of music and then it was like, just like send it into the void, nothing. And then like several months later, it was like, cool. So the album's coming out, <laughs> the album's coming out. And do you think you could play like, I want to be your dog on guitar? <laughs> Basically like, okay, we love your soundscape stuff, but like, do you have rock chops? And then like, next thing I know, I'm the like co-writer on an Iggy record and I'm playing in his band. It's just been kind of like a series of moments where I'm just like pinching myself harder and harder. It's just like, is this really my life? It's just been an incredible gift getting to collaborate with one of my musical heroes and um, getting to be a part of the long history of performing his iconic songs live. That's such a huge honor. And, um, you know, I, I don't take that lightly at all. And um, just really, really grateful that our our paths cross due to um, YouTube algorithm. This is a set list from the shows I was playing with Iggy Pop in 2019. Uh, we were doing the full album, Free, uh, which is the, the record that I, I composed uh, some music for Iggy. And then we 
got to play so I'm like some total bangers. It was really fun to put a board together for this tour because it was like half novellery soundscapey songs and then half like classic Iggy. Um, so it was like really interesting Frankenstein board. The set we're doing as of uh, now is a lot more uh, straightforward. Um, that's been really amazing to put a board together for. So this wall, I feel like I have a, a pretty good mix of like my old school and like new school pedals. Uh, I have the Boss PS5 and the Boss DD6. Unfortunately, not my original versions of those pedals because those were stolen in a 20. 12, but um, I find that I use them for such specific things that I had to reacquire them and I still use them to this day. These two pedals, uh, Count to Five is a pretty popular kind of like experimental pedal by, made by Montreal Assembly. This also by Montreal Assembly is the 856 for Zeller's Asin. It kind of like blows your mind. Uh, it's a really great studio pedal. Uh, I used that when I was writing music for my album Arrow, specifically uh, the track Xeoxanthin, which I came up with that title as kind of a tribute to Zeller's Azen, because I was like, what's well, another long ass word that starts with a Z um, that people will think is interesting. Theremin pedal by Electro Faustus. Uh, they gave this to me at NAMM. I was so excited because I used to play a theremin when I was in college and this is a pedal theremin. It has a optical eye sensor here. So if it's on your board and you move your foot closer, farther away from it, uh, that affects the, uh, the sound of, of the theremin. So I put this on my board and I was really excited to use it for the first time. I was playing a festival in Malmo, Sweden. And I get to the part where I use the theremin and I turn it on and I start moving my foot and nothing happens because I'm in a dark like church venue. So I had to take the flashlight on my iPhone and shine it on it and that activated and like you could use the, the sensor. So kind of like had to think on my feet. Uh, great pedal, maybe like use it for outdoor festival shows. My H9, I'm super proud of. They sent me one of the few copper H9s that they made. Um, very few of these ever made out into the world. So you can see I've stomped it pretty hard. <laughs> Got some cracks there, but I'm very proud of the beautiful patina on the, the copper casing here. When it first arrived um, in 2017, it was just like gleaming, no imperfection. And uh, there's been a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears gone into making this beauty look the way that it does. Love this pedal. It's always on my board. I love Game Changer Audio. Uh, really interesting guys out of Latvia. This is their newest pedal and I'm showing it to you because I love it and my mom got it for me for my birthday. So it makes me think of her when I step on it. So when I was in college, um, it didn't have a lot of money and the main way that I got gear was going to pawn shops. And in Austin, they had amazing pawn shops. Uh, there was one in particular called Doc Holiday. It's where I bought my first double neck guitar. But my approach at the time was just like, there's this cool thing I just discovered um, how can I get that? So I would trade in stuff that I had. I didn't feel very like precious about my, my gear. I just saw it as like a way to negotiate trying new things. And fortunately, I'm not a college student anymore. And I kind of settled into viewing my gear as like my artist palette. You know, the first step in my creative process when I'm trying to write new music is to grab a bunch of pedals and put a board together. And I find that um, even if it's something I haven't used in years, it ex still, still exists uh, as like a file in my brain that I can access. And so just being able to go and grab stuff and, and put it together is hugely inspiring to me. And I find that 
a lot of times the magic of a pedal isn't immediately apparent. Like sometimes the magic of a pedal is how it interacts with other pedals. And so um, I find like kind of having a personal library of, of effects is um, my new uh, mode of viewing my gear. I wouldn't necessarily view it as like I've become more sentimental, but more that I see the value in holding on to things and um, having access to that inspiration when I need it.